Order. It's time for questions to the Office of the First Minister and Deputy First Minister, and we'll start with listed questions. And members, questions 1, 4, and 6 have been withdrawn. I call Mr. Robin Newton. Question number 2, Mr. Speaker. I can't call you, Mr. Speaker. With your permission, I will ask Junior Minister McCann to uh, take this question. The Social Investment Fund is a growing success story. It is at the heart of the executive's delivering social change framework, making life-changing differences to people and communities facing disadvantage. 25 projects have valued at £37 million have now commenced, with 10 operational and more in the pipeline. In addition, over 600, uh, sorry, over 600 participants are benefiting from projects in areas such as early intervention, employment and childcare. We can expect these numbers to ramp up significantly as delivery continues. Belfast East allocated its £8 million to employment, education and capital projects. Good progress has been made on the capital side with two of the capital projects, Best of the East and Bryson Street Surgery, due to complete construction by the 31st of March 2016. Also, letters of offer have been issued to the approved components of the Zones Capital Cluster Project. We are working to expedite approvals for the remaining three revenue projects. Thank you. And Robin Newton for the supplement. Uh, thank, thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I thank the junior minister for her uh, answer. Uh, I don't, I don't think I have to spell out just how important uh, uh, the revenue uh, projects are. Could I ask a junior minister if she would uh, take on board the need to push forward, on, particularly on the employment uh, revenue initiative and indeed on the educational one? And in terms of the capital uh, approach, would the junior minister agree with me that when you're addressing uh, the capital investment, that it is much better to take a strategic approach uh, within a geographical area, and I would suggest to her that Clara would state rather than a piecemeal approach to the development of any capital projects. Yes, uh, may I totally agree with the member in his last um, comment there. I think that, that we have, in terms of um, learned lessons, even in terms of the Urban Village um, programme, um, where, where you have to particularly. Um, you know, make connections with the council and the, what they are doing, particular, particularly in terms of their um, community planning. I think it's very, very important in terms of the capital projects that you know that, that you aren't doing one thing here at central government and another thing here at local government. I think that, that it's very, very important. But these projects, particularly in the social investment um, uh, in, in social investment fund, were actually projects where, where, where the, the people on the ground, the community, came together. They decided who was going to be in the steering groups. And I think that, that they were the ones that decided which projects were the most important going forward. And you're totally right about the early intervention and the employment projects. I know in other areas, some have, uh, we have actually, myself and the other junior minister, have actually been at the launches and talking to people even from those launches took place that have participated in those programmes. They are quite successful in the way they're being rolled out. I call Mr. Loris Kelly. I must say, I scarcely recognise the description as one of the most successful programmes at the Executive in relation to the Social Investment Fund, given we're so far behind in delivery. Uh, could the, the Minister, uh, would the Minister not agree with me, at this stage, after five years into the programme for government, we should actually be doing post project evaluations and not actually uh, trying to get letters of offer out and what uh, then uh, will happen to the money that is unspent will does the minister anticipate it running into the next program for government potentially another five years before it's spent well you know i i, I do understand that you know everybody was frustrated that the, these actual this um, particular project or this program took away in, in, in getting rolled out but can I just remind the member that, that uh, from, the, as, from the 22nd of January there, £58 million has already been committed, and the further £22 million out of the £80 million has been allocated to uh, projects that are in the approval process. There are a number of revenue projects, I think there's about nine that are in the process now, have started. Um, there's a number of five capital projects are at the construction stage, two are due to be completed, as I said in my last answer, by the 31st of March, and one has already been uh, completed in Coleraine. So I think that, that really, you know, and you have to understand, revenue projects aren't just projects that you spend right away. 
you know, some of these revenue projects are going to be over a two, three year period, so you just don't spend it right away anyway. Those projects will have to be given money uh, as they go along. So I think you know, um, you know, we have to remember that, that this, this was a new, a new sort of programme. I think that we are now in a position where £58 million pounds is committed and £22 million pounds have been allocated um, to those that are in the approval process. So I think that's, that's uh, in my opinion, that's progress. And we move on. Mr. Kieran McCarthy. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Question number three to the Junior Minister, or to the Deputy First Minister. Now, the actions and commitments within the Together Building a United Community strategy will impact on all areas within our society, including rural areas. Under the United Youth Programme, 13 pilot projects have commenced, providing around 360 places. Young people from all areas can avail of these, and one of the pilots is currently being delivered by the Rural Development Council in Mid Ulster. Of the five shared neighbourhoods uh, currently under construction, two are in rural areas Crossgar Road, Saintfield, and Burn Road, Cookstown. The three shared education campuses announced to date are located in rural areas Limavari, uh, Moy, and Ballycastle. 101 summer camps have been delivered in 2015, involving around 4,200 children and young people uh, mainly from rural areas. The Department of Culture, Arts and Leisure is also considering expansion of their cross-community youth sports programme into a rural area. And as with all other departments, the Department of Agriculture and Rural Development is represented on the Ministerial Panel and the Good Relations Programme Board. Under the strategy, DARD has committed to working with rural community organisations to encourage increased in openness and accessibility and to reduce chill factors and fears that prevent open access. Contracts are in place with lead service providers for the delivery of a rural community development support service, which is promoting and supporting work in a number of areas, including community relations. And I call Mr. Kieran McCarthy for supplement. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I thank the Deputy First Minister for a very detailed response. But the Deputy First Minister will, will know that in some rural communities, division can often be subtle and, and less visible than in elsewhere. Uh, has his department any separate or special regeneration plans to tackle that where he or his department sees that may arise? Well, I, I think quite obviously the, the ministerial panel is consistently keeping on the review how this program is uh, uh, being delivered. Uh, and I think thus far we've made good progress in relation to it, and not least the, in the Fresh Start Agreement, the allocation of 60 million over the course of the next five years. But obviously, if there's a particular concern about a particular area that the member has, then my door is open. We're quite willing to have a conversation about that. But I think that we're very focused on the need to ensure that all rural areas are included and that the programme was delivered in a very inclusive way. And comes to Barry uh, I'm sure the Deputy First Minister will agree with me that community safety is at the core of cohesive rural communities. And can I just invite him in his, his role as a, a joint leader with the First Minister to make a statement or a comment on the situation developing in my community of West Tyrone where in the past week, uh, five masses have been targeted for car break-ins and thefts. And I'm really emphasizing the importance of community safety in rural communities by way of making our communities cohesive and safe. Well, well first of all, uh, without hesitation, uh, the, the First Minister and I would unreservedly condemn the actions of those who would uh, be involved in such criminality in or around any place of worship. And I think there's obviously a, a huge responsibility whenever there's a particular outbreak for uh, the local community working in harmony with the police service to ensure that uh, this is uh, combated in as effective a way as possible. Obviously, somebody out there knows that this is happening. There are people there with information. And I would encourage anybody with any information whatsoever to pass that information on to the police. And congratulations to the other member for his imaginative use of that question. And I call Mr. Danny Macross. Yes, thank you, Mr. Speaker, uh, can I just ask the minister, uh, 
what progress has been made in implementing uh, TBUC in my constituency of West Rome? Well, I, I think uh, obviously from, from our perspective, we're very focused on uh, ensuring that the delivery of the Together Building the United Community project is uh, implemented successfully in every single constituency. Uh, the detail of, of your own constituency is something that, that I will write to you about. Uh, I think that qu quite obviously th this is a very uh, exciting program. It's one that we're prepared to put a, a tremendous amount of uh, funds into because it is absolutely vital that we uh, ensure that we uh, bring our community together. Uh, and I think also recognizing the huge responsibility that politicians have, not just in the delivery of the program, but by leading by example, to ensure that uh, we're not just bringing people together at grassroots level, but the people at grassroots level can see the politicians here in this assembly are prepared to work together for the common good. And that's why I think the negotiation of the Fresh Start Agreement prior to Christmas was so vitally important in terms of showing the community that uh, decisions can be made which will improve their lives and of, of course a whole range of decisions were made during the course of that uh, negotiation. So obviously the uh, West Tyrone area is a very uh, important constituency as are all of the others. So the programs are being ruled out, they've been ruled out effectively. The detail of what's happening in West Tyrone we will write to you about. Going to call Ms. Sandra over. Thank you, Mr. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Can I ask the Deputy First Minister what is the total spend, and how much of that is additional, uh, and how much would have been spent anyway? Well, we, we've allocated uh, t 10 million uh, for uh, this financial year. Uh, we've agreed, as I said in my earlier answer, to put aside uh, 60 million over the course of the next uh, five years. And uh, that's, that's obviously extra money that we have budgeted for because we believe that uh, this prog <coughs> program is, is worthy of uh, not a one or two year program, but over uh, an extended period of some, something like five years, uh, we think it will bring enormous benefits towards bringing our community together. But I mean, in short, the answer is that uh, the, the 60 million is new money. Thank you. And I'll call Ms. Katrina Ruan. Ms. Divaracoui, question number five, please. Uh, Kent Collier, with your permission. Mr. Speaker, I will ask Junior Minister McCann to answer this question. The Executive's Active Aging Strategy was published on the Department's website on Tuesday, the 26th of January. The purpose of the Active Aging Strategy is to transform attitudes to and services for older people. It is important that we fully acknowledge the enormous contribution that older people make to our society and that we challenge the negative stereotyping of older people. It will provide direction for departments' policies, make connections between strategies and lead to the improvement of services for older people. In developing the strategy, we work closely with the former Commissioner for Older People, Claire Keating, and the Aging Strategy Advisory Group, which included as members older people and people working for organisations that represent older people. The strategy sets a vision for an age-friendly region in which people, as they get older, are valued and supported to live actively to their fullest potential, with their rights and dignity protected. The strategic aims of the stra strategy are based around the UN principles for older persons. There are 18 of these which are grouped under five themes – independence, participation, care, self-fulfillment and dignity. The strategy's vision and strategic aims will be implemented by those departments and agencies with the resources, expertise and specific responsibilities for key programmes and services that improve the lives for older people. Thank you. Ms. Katrina Ruan for supplement. I'd like to thank the Minister, the Junior Minister for her answer, comprehensive answer there. And I wonder would she outline the next steps in the active age strategy, especially given the number of uh, older people in our society? Yeah, and, and really, you know, I mean, in terms of next steps to monitor progress against the outcome set in the, in the strategy, we will consult obviously on the draft indicator set that, that is set out as well. I think the important thing um, for this strategy, and you know, we, we were myself and Junior Minister Pingali were at uh, an event earlier on today. 
um, called Dignity Action Day, and it was uh, organised by the National Pensioners Convention. And basically, what we did at that was we signed up to what was called a, a dignity uh, a dignity charter, if you like. And you know, at that event, it was very, very clear. You know that, that the dignity and you know that that people's dignity and their rights are res need to be respected right through out um, their lives. And just because someone gets older doesn't mean to say that they they have any less of a contribution to make to society. And I think you know that even in our, our sort of um, when we are looking at the strategy, we were saying it's a very very live strategy. And you know it's not just about the strategy; it's about how the strategy is rolled out and how those services are rolled out and how, how those rights are protected and that respect is given to older people. So certainly that's the way we'll be monitoring this and that's how we'll be progressing this. And I call Mr. Patsy McGlone. Uh, just could I ask the, the minister? The, the active ageing strategy, including a number of other strategies uh, for, included within the roles of OFM DFE, uh, are going to be transferred over to uh, DFC in the next mandate. Uh, can the Minister outline what level of communications and discussions have taken place to ensure that that transition is as smooth as possible? Well, obviously, you know, um, uh, I will tell the member that there has been some discussion, obviously, um, at an executive level on, you know, where different sort of areas of policy responsibility sits and that I mean and you, the member will be aware that over the, the next period we will have time in this assembly to discuss the different functions that go with that as well in the different depart departments and I think that, that really you know we have tried to, to keep that fit um, uh, as well as it can be but can be kept in terms of that but I think that the important thing for a strategy like the activation strategy it's an executive strategy it's not actually an OFMD FM strategy because it is actually a strategy that, that is there for all departments to, you know, to be held account to, if you like, in, in terms of that. But that they fulfil their responsibilities when they are caring for, for people, uh, older people in society. That all those, and right across the board of its services or whatever it is, that all of that is, is sort of done. But it's an executive sort of responsibility as opposed to an OFMD FM one. And we move on and I call Ms Karen McKevitt. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Question 7. Uh, the Stormont uh, Agreement and Implementation Plan of Fresh Start confirms the reduction in the number of departments from 12 to 9 from May 2016, along with detailed proposals for specific aspects of implementation for which the Executive is responsible. This will reduce the number of ministers, special advisors, permanent secretaries and staff working in central support functions. As part of the agreement, it was proposed that the Department for Communities should assume sponsorship responsibilities for the Commissioner for Children and Young People and the Commissioner for Older People, with the exception of the appointment of the respective Commissioners. In putting forward this proposal, it was considered that the roles of the two bodies were a more natural fit within the Department for Communities, given its focus on issues affecting citizens here. However, while the proposal provided a better alignment in terms of roles, and responsibilities. It was also recognised that the post holders in these significant posts should have the confidence of both the First and Deputy First Minister. This will uh, also help to ensure the important work these bodies carry out will receive the appropriate cross-party support to ensure they deliver on behalf of the community. These public appointments are, of course, subject to open competition with appointments based on merit, and the process is subject to regulation by the Office of the Commissioner for Public Appointments. Thank you, and for thank you Mr Speaker. Can I thank the, the Joint First Minister for uh, his response? Uh, given that the Commissioners will be under a new remit of uh, the Department um, of OFM DFM, how do you think the, the, the communications when you're the employer but yet they're under the remit of a different department, how do you think that communications is going to work and has there been any discussions on it? Well, uh, obviously we we, we think it will work because the, the, the decision has been made that these uh, important agencies will transfer to the Department for Communities. Uh, I think that obviously the responsibility that the First Minister and I have is an overarching responsibility for the work of the Executive. And uh, I don't think there's going to be any difficulty whatsoever in uh, us uh, working with whoever the new Minister is in, in that department to ensure that there is continuity of service to the public. 
Mr. Adrian Cochrane Watson. Mr. Speaker, it's clear that the functions of the executive office have moved radically since they were first announced last March. Uh, it seems to me that they're now um, retaining delivery functions and moving away from the more coordinating, coordinating role that they were first envisaged to have. Is, is that a question or a statement? What, what is the question? To comment on that, Deputy First Minister, it seems to me they're now being, um, they're being retaining delivery functions. And initially, there were to be more a coordinating role from the new office of the new executive office. Why has that move taken place? Well, I think uh, the, the decisions that have been made in relation to the reduction of the number of, of departments and the transfer of various services to uh, what will effectively be uh, a new department. <coughs> is a, a, a very natural process for us to be involved in because it's all about ensuring that we uh, have proper delivery for the benefit of citizens. The, the First Minister and the Deputy First Minister obviously uh, being in the lead uh, within the Executive and representing the two largest parties in the Executive uh, have a duty and a responsibility for uh, obviously the work of the Executive which, which does include uh, coordination but it also includes ensuring that all departments uh, within the executive are delivering in the context of the uh, changes that have been made as a result of the, uh, the decisions made to reduce the number of departments. So it's about effective delivery. It's about uh, against the backdrop of a fresh start. And I think we are off to a good start, ensuring that we continue to deliver for citizens. And I think we can do that as long as all parties in the executive and there will be a new executive in the aftermath of the election that recognise that the demand of the people is that we continue to work together for their benefit. Okay. Um, Ms Judith Cochrane is not in her place. I call Mr Gregory Campbell. Nine. Uh, achieving our, our vision of a united uh, community based on equality of opportunity, the desirability of good relations and reconciliation, requires the collective commitment and effort of everyone. Government uh, must work alongside statutory, voluntary, community and private sector partners to achieve the shared vision and aims of this strategy. We acknowledge that continued political leadership is crucial to the effective implementation of this strategy, and we will continue to give that leadership and drive forward this important agenda, but much wider than this is the need to have a collaborative approach across society. Everyone in society has a role in progressing this work and everyone can make a contribution to achieving positive, good relations, outcomes and to build a united, shared and reconciled community. Mr Campbell for a supplement. Thank you, uh, Mr Speaker. Uh, the First Minister, Deputy First Minister indicated that uh, everyone has a role to play uh, and that is welcome. But how does he feel in terms of trying to show uh, forward thinking and leadership in terms of bringing the community together. How does he feel that on Friday a former terrorist who was questioned by the police in the Republic followed his lead in declining to give any information about a person that was still alive had been involved in the Birmingham pub bombs, given that the Deputy First Minister took exactly the same stance when he was in the box in terms of the Savile inquiry, refusing to name anyone else involved in terrorism along with him? Well, uh, first of all, I think maybe there's sometimes this particular member doesn't understand that uh, the question that he is asking is to the office of First and Deputy First Minister. Uh, I am here to answer on behalf of the First and Deputy First Minister. Uh, I don't believe that that question is in any way appropriate. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I thank the Deputy First Minister for his answer. Can I ask uh, the Deputy First Minister why, three years on from the publication of the Together Building a United Community Strategy, uh, the Department has yet failed to introduce an enhanced good relations impact assessment on all executive policy that would ensure sharing over separation for all policy? 
Well, I think in relation to the Together Build a United Community uh, policy strategy, huge progress is being made. I think that uh, quite clearly the sub very substantial funds that we have allocated over the course of a five-year period is a very clear indicator of our uh, absolute belief in the need to ensure that uh, good relations is regarded as a priority for the executive. I, I think in terms of the particular strategy that the, the member has, made, uh, has indicated, I, I certainly think that the delivery mechanisms which are now in place under the auspices of the ministerial panel uh, is about delivery and is about putting in place uh, not just the pilot projects but the very proactive uh, structures and uh, strategies which are required to ensure the ongoing uh, bringing together of our community. If there's a particular aspect of that which concerns the member, we're quite willing to meet with them and to discuss that. Can I could ask the Minister what is the funding situation in relation to the implementation of this strategy for Minamagot? Well, I think in my earlier answers I, I clearly indicated that uh, you know, uh, there are very substantial funds available uh, for this programme. Building a united community represents a key building block of the programme for government. In recognition of this, £10 million revenue funding was made available in the 2015-16 budget to aid implementation of the strategy, supplementing other good relations funding provided by OFM DFM. In addition, uh, 1.27 million of capital funding was secured to enable departments to progress work on the headline actions. Following ministerial appro uh, approval of proposals, the subsequent allocations enabled officials to uh, progress with the headline actions as well as various funding programs. And as I indicated earlier, the recent Fresh Start Agreement committed to the provision of 60 million over five years in support of the executive's delivery of confidence and relationship building measures within and between communities contributing to the creation of a shared future. We are currently working with all our departments to identify their financial requirements which will enable consideration of proposals of allocations in 2016-17 of the 12 million available to us. Call Mr. John Dallin. Mr. Speaker, as uh, building a united community is the responsibility of the First and Deputy First Minister's Department, I hope the children were all safely in their classrooms and didn't hear the exchanges between Mr. Campbell and uh, the uh, Deputy First Minister early, earlier. Would the Deputy First Minister agree with me that this is the most serious subject because children are our greatest asset and the present generation don't deserve to be lured into the terrible deeds of the past? Would he agree with me that summer camps on their own is only a beginning and much more needs to be done? Well, I, I absolutely agree with the member uh, of the importance of this strategy. Uh, and I, I certainly uh, agree with him that the uh, huge priority in all of this is the future of our young people. And uh, we, we've just uh, had in this assembly today uh, three schools, two from Enniskillen and one from Oma, uh, young people who are involved in politics. Some of them are here at the early stages of this uh, session. Uh, and I think the member is absolutely right. I think that all of us have a duty and a responsibility to uh, recognise the importance of building a, a better future. Un unfortunately, there are some members, a tiny number of members in this House, who are only really interested in recrimination and are not interested in reconciliation. And I think that's very sad. I, uh, I spoke about this at the weekend when I was at the Kinsale Peace Project in County Cork uh, in what was a, a very hugely attended uh, conversation between myself and those people who were interested in what was happening here, uh, particularly in the peace process. And during the course of that engagement, a man stepped forward who informed the audience that he was a former member of the Grenadier Guards. He was very generous in his remarks, and, and we both shook hands. I think that's where the encouragement comes from, that there are many, many people within our society who were previously at odds with one another, who recognise the need to be involved in this sort of work. The others we can leave behind. Members, and that ends the period for listed questions. We now move on to topicals, and I call Mr. Jared Diver. 
Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Um, can I ask the Deputy First Minister, given today's OECD findings, which unfortunately indicate that some of our students are struggling with literacy and numeracy, um, and given the particular level of disadvantage suffered in the Northwest and in my own constituency of Foyle, which I'm sure is not immune to that challenge around skills, why has the Northwest Ministerial Subgroup, which I understand has been tasked with dealing with disadvantage in my area, only met on two occasions, the second of which was a meeting that was called at 24 hours notice. And what does the Deputy First Minister hope that this, uh, this grouping can achieve in 2016? Well, there have been, as the member has uh, indicated, uh, two meetings of the uh, subgroup, uh, ministerial subgroup. Uh, this came about uh, as a result of a conversation between myself and the previous uh, First Minister. And the uh, present First Minister uh, has uh, clearly showed her intention to continue with what is important work. Obviously, last year was uh, very much taken up by negotiations. Uh, that did uh, present a huge difficulty and a problem. But as a result of the conversations that were had, uh, the reality is that action has flowed from that. And that action resulted in the recent budget where uh, £130 million was allocated for improvements to the A6, which was a big demand in the North West. Also, funds put aside for the first stage of the A5. Uh, and of course, uh, very important conversations in recent times about how we can advance the situation within McGee University. And that's without mentioning the fact that hundreds of millions are being spent on turning Alton Galvin into a state-of-the-art uh, hospital for the North West. So I think that uh, what disappointed me about the events of the la latter part of last year was the fact that the SDLP actually voted against the budget which uh, allocated those funds for the North West. I think that's something the SDLP need to explain. Mr. Deborah for a supplementary. Yeah, I, I, again, I would actually ask the Deputy First Minister, and will I take his answer uh, in relation to the other matters that he's listed? It has not addressed the point that I made about disadvantage in skills among our young people. It was a matter, matter of very, very serious concern, and I would like to know what this executive is going to do to actually uh, battle that. Thank you. Well, I, I think the member does a disservice to the schools uh, that are in the Northwest and that are in uh, the city where he lives. Uh, I'm very proud of the fact that I was the minister who took a decision to build the new St Mary's and the new St Cecilia's and the new St Patrick's Primary School in Derry. Uh, they are first class schools as are all of the other schools in the area. So they are providing uh, first class, uh, they provide, well, people can, heckle, people can heckle from the sidelines if they want. But I, I work on the basis that people who are heckling really don't want to hear the answer. And, and the answer is that huge progress is being made with first class schools being provided for the people of Derry and in the North West. In terms of the issue of skills, that's where the, uh, the, the, the work that we need to do in relation to McGee University and the great work that's happening at the North West College, uh, even as we speak. We need to ensure that people have the skills so that we can, when we are successful in bringing in foreign direct investment, ensure that we have the people with the ability to take up those uh, vital jobs. And I call Mr. Alistair Law. Um, thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Deputy First Minister will no doubt be aware of speculation over the weekend uh, that the Prime Minister is likely to look at a, a referendum on the European in-out referendum uh, in an early uh, uh, June time. Um, obviously, that will cause difficulties for our own assembly election and confusing the two messages. Can I ask the Deputy First Minister if he would share that concern of an early European referendum rather than a later one, perhaps in September time? Yes, I, I, I would absolutely uh, share that concern. And uh, it, it's obvious that uh, we are not the only people concerned about that. I listened last weekend, I think it was, to the First Minister of Scotland uh, ex express her uh, disagreement with. Uh, such a referendum in such close proximity to, to their uh, elections. So obviously this is uh, 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 an important matter, but even more important is what is going to be put 
to uh, people in the context of that referendum. And I know that uh, presently, over the course of the next probably two days, uh, further very important meetings are taking place between David Cameron and uh, senior uh, representatives of the European Union, uh, the outcome of which will probably, probably decide uh, what will be put to referendum. And uh, I think that uh, it's no secret to anybody that I have huge concerns about the prospect that the strategy being adopted by David Cameron effectively is sleepwalking all of us onto an exit from Europe. And Mr. Ross for a supplement. Thank you. I mean, the debate around uh, our membership of the European Union is an important one, and in order to make sure that we have a proper debate on this, it's important that we have enough space between the Assembly election and the, the European referendum. Um, can I ask him uh, what discussions that OFMDFM have had with other devolved regions across the United Kingdom, or indeed with uh, our national government, around the timing of the referendum and whether there's scope for negotiation to try to uh, pick a September date rather than a June date? Well, I, th I think that uh, the point uh, made by the member is very, very important. I, I think that up until now, although there have been conversations, uh, because of the inability to work out exactly when the referendum is, then it, it's very difficult to zero in on uh, how we take this forward. But certainly on, on account of it now being flagged up that there could be a referendum in June, I think it is very important that the First Minister and myself uh, engage with uh, David Cameron uh, and, and others, indeed the devolved administrations in Scotland and in Wales, uh, about the, the issue. But I mean, it's on the public record. Uh, the First Minister of Scotland has put it on the public record. I think it'll come as no surprise to anybody that we here would also share concerns about close proximity of a referendum to the Assembly elections here. And we haven't even dealt with the arguments around the merits of uh, uh, stay under, stay out. But one thing we all need to bear in mind, for example, is, is how this could economically affect ourselves here in the north, particularly when you have, for example, the uh, Confederation of British Industry in the north saying that over 90% of their members are against exit. Thank you. And it comes to Jerry. <coughs> Good morning, uh, John Coyle, and maybe a bit further to the previous question. Given that this region is a net beneficiary of the EU, uh, would the Deputy First Minister perhaps uh, expand on what the financial implications are of uh, Britain exiting Europe? Well, I, I think the, the financial implications of this are, are absolutely massive for us, not least from our uh, farming community. The north of Ireland is a net beneficiary of the European Union. We have received significant support from the EU through a number of different funding programmes which in the event of a Brexit we would no longer have access to. And this includes structural and regional development funds which are comprised of the European Regional Development Fund, the European Social Fund, Interreg, the Peace 4 programme, uh, which are worth €982 million Euro over the current period of 2014 to 20. Loss of this funding would be severely detrimental to society here and I think devastating for our local economy. Uh, we would also lose access to funding under the Common Agricultural Policy, which is worth approximately $2.5 billion in the current 2014-20 period. And this represents a massive uh, investment in the sector. We all recognise the importance of the agricultural sector to our economy and our rural communities, and CAP funding has been vital to its sustained growth and development for years. Furthermore, the potential loss of access to competitive EU funding, which in the period 2011-12 to 2014-15 amounted to over $95 million. Uh, that would be a, a huge blow, particularly to the business sector and research and development, which are central to developing the economy. Uh, Gwen Buigas, lesson uh, Kate Ira Lahan of Frag I thank uh, Deputy First Minister for his uh, answer up tonight. And given what he has said, uh, uh, does the uh, Deputy First Minister feel that the British government uh, has kept the devolved uh, regions um, up to date uh, on the, uh, the negotiations and involved them in them? Well, I, I can't say that, that they have. And uh, 
the earlier question addressed this, but in, in reality, the, to date, the British government have informed, but not involved, or consulted OFM, DFM in relation to their negotiations on EU membership, and that is also probably true of Scotland and of Wales. And the Commissioner, Mike Nesbitt. Mr Speaker, thank you very much. Um, three weeks ago, the Prime Minister announced a billion pounds of spending uh, to enhance mental health services uh, in England. Is the Deputy First Minister aware if that has a Barnet consequential for Northern Ireland? Well, if, if, if he made the announcement in the context of that being for England, uh, that we need to explore whether or not it has a Barnet consequential for us. And I have no doubt the Department of Finance and Personnel are presently, whenever these and all announcements like it are made, exploring how we can benefit from that. Uh, I thank the Deputy First Minister. As he said to Mrs McEvitt just a few minutes ago, he has an overarching responsibility for the working uh, of the executive. Uh, and it's on that basis I ask that question. Uh, and that I ask this follow-up question. Would he support me in saying if there is a Barnet consequential, that that money should be ring-fenced for mental health provision in Northern Ireland? Because while it is fine to build roads and create jobs and enhance skills, uh, for the one in four of us suffering poor mental health and well-being, it is meaningless because of the debilitating nature of the illness. Well, I absolutely agree with the, the member. If there is a Barnet consequential flowing out of that announcement, I, I do believe that it should be ring-fenced because I do accept absolutely the argument that he has made consistently about the need to vastly improve our services to those who are affected by poor mental health. Commissioner Ian McCray. Thank you, Mr Speaker. The Ulster Unionist Party proposed as part of their, part of their budget um, proposals in last financial year to use up the money from the Social Investment Fund. Does the Deputy First Minister believe that had that have happened that we would have been able to deliver projects that are, have been done or are in the process of being done? Well, you know, I, th I think ra rather than focus on what other people do, whether it be in relation to a, a party voting against the budget or parties not voting against the budget, but uh, uttering criticisms of the budget, we would rather focus on uh, what we are doing, which is about constructively and positively delivering for communities. <clears throat> and of course, the Social Investment Fund is uh, fr fr a bottom-up approach where we, we have local communities identifying their priorities, and we, we've been quite happy to go with that. And uh, as a result of that, and there has been criticisms in this House about uh, the delay and all of it, but the, the delay is about getting it right. Uh, these are huge amounts of money. And we need to be sure that uh, this money is being spent properly in the interests of uh, all of our people. You, know, you can clearly see from the projects that are being ruled out at the moment that, that they are having and are going to have a very positive effect within communities. And, and I remember uh, an SDLP member for West Belfast at the very beginning, whenever the Social Investment Fund was being spoken about, uh, tried to, to make out that it was a slush fund for paramilitaries. Well, I think the working out of all of this and the very careful nature of how this is uh, dealt with has proven that statement to be totally and absolutely wrong. Social Investment Fund uh, is and will bring huge benefits to local communities. They're the ones who have made the decisions, and from the projects that have been put forward thus far, uh, they are all highly creditable projects. Pay for a very quick supplement. Um, obviously, the 1.4 million investment from the Social Investment Fund into my own constituency is something that I welcome. Um, and I take from the Deputy First Minister's question, he doesn't want to get into um, the um, who he said, she said aspect of those that were for and against it. But does the Deputy First Minister not believe that those who would um, oppose such a measure or intend? Um, propose um, another alternative use for it um, are in essence saying that they don't believe that these projects are good projects and that the executive should um, reprioritize its, its budget. Well, I mean, there, there, there has been criticism 
from the party that the member has uh, identified. Uh, and I think that uh, that criticism is wrong-headed. I think quite clearly these projects, whether it be in Mid-Ulster or elsewhere, will bring enormous benefits to uh, local communities. Uh, and I think that it, it, it behoves anybody in this House to try to undermine uh, projects which, uh, which we are funding on foot of communities identifying for us developments in their areas which will bring enormous benefits to them. And, uh, time is up. <clears throat>